Good morning, everybody. Thanks so much for coming. I'm Michael Klein, the Interim Executive Director of the uh, William J. Hughes Center for Public Policy at Stockton University, and it's really my pleasure to welcome you here for this event and with my expert panelists to talk about the, the state of New Jersey's beaches. I just have some quick introductory re remarks, and then we'll get to the experts. And for the record, I wore the best tie I could find that's got little dolphins on it, so I thought that was appropriate. Um, but as, as residents from New Jersey and our neighboring states get ready to enjoy the Fourth of July holiday, uh, the Hughes Center for Public Policy at Stockton University is proud to highlight how sound public policy and strong partnerships among university scientists and government agencies have brought the beaches back in New Jersey. More than five years after Superstorm Sandy and its historic storm surge slammed into our coast, New Jersey beaches are back, and in some cases better than ever. They are all in great shape for the 4th of July holiday and for the entire summer season. As the head of Stockton University's Coastal Research Center will explain, the state of New Jersey recognized the need back in 1985 for scientific experts to examine our beaches, uh, especially to evaluate damage from storms to allow our state and local governments to be el eligible for federal restoration funds. Informed by research and supported by federal funds, our partners at the Armory Corps of Engineers and the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection's Division of Coastal Engineering do the hard work of nourishing and replenishing our beaches. Through well-informed public policy and cooperation among Stockton scientists and federal and state agencies, New Jersey's 127 miles of coastline are preserved for public enjoyment and protected for our vulnerable wildlife. The work of the Hughes Center, where I have the pleasure to work, is inspired by former Congressman and Ambassador Bill Hughes, who sponsored many pieces of legislation to protect New Jersey's beaches, including the Ocean Dumping Ban Act of 1988 that's going to celebrate its 30th anniversary on November 18th. I'm sorry, Ambassador Hughes uh, is not able to join us here this morning, but I wanted to uh, recognize the lasting legacy that he's left uh, for all of New Jersey's beaches through his hard work. So uh, before I introduce our, our uh, expert speakers, I need to thank my colleagues who really helped organize this event today. John Frugian, who's hiding there in the back, is uh, the Senior Research Associate at the Hughes Center. Uh, Diane D'Amico, who's furiously taking notes, uh, is the Director of News and Media Relations at Stockton. Daria uh, Grabova is uh, behind the scenes there, my me social media maven, and uh, our host with the most, Alex Marino, and this beautiful facility here, the Carnegie Center, that's part of uh, Stockton University. So let me hand it off to the real expert, my uh, friend and colleague, uh, Stu Farrell, who can uh, talk about the work he's been doing at the Coastal Research Center and the importance of its work for New Jersey's beaches. Well, the um, Coastal Research Center actually owes its uh, origins uh, to, owes its origins to a long forgotten storm. Um, Hurricane Gloria. Okay, it's be right away. Well, a little bit, maybe. <laughs> yeah, Hurricane Gloria in 1985 did considerable damage to the Jersey coast. And the, the um, agencies here at the state were unable to provide uh, confirming data as to how the damage occurred and what the amount was and where it was worst and et cetera. And uh, then Senator Bradley uh, got a special congressional appropriation to uh, provide funding to address the problem so that in subsequent events there would be an, a, a way to deal with these sorts of problems. And one of the uses of some of that money was to establish a monitoring program for the entire ocean front coast of New Jersey, including some of the bay shores of Raritan Bay and the western coast of Cape May County, uh, to establish survey locations that would be vis visited at least annually, and currently are visited twice a year, once in the fall season and once in the spring season, to take a survey across the dunes, <clears throat> across the beach, into the water, to a water depth of approximately 16 feet. Uh, that essentially is the envelope of change that takes place between normal summertime wave conditions and things that happen during storms and storm events. So 
as a start off, I thought I would run through a really quick assessment of what happened in New Jersey from Hurricane Sandy. These uh, scenes, you know, have, of course, had blazed into your mind six years ago. But Hurricane Sandy was an odd event. It was a dying hurricane that met up with a cold front that ran into a blocking high pressure system over Iceland, which caused retrograde motion, which means that it was moving from east to west, not from southwest to northeast like they normally do, and progressed to make landfall just north of Brigantine, New Jersey. So that from Brigantine south, we saw winds of 65, 70 miles an hour for one high tide cycle. Whereas north of that, Long Beach Island being the first developed area north of the, where it was made landfall, uh, they saw two high tide cycles with high velocity winds, which made a huge difference. So this was a storm not terribly unlike what was called the perfect storm in 1991, which also did retrograde motion, but off of uh, Newfoundland and uh, northern Maine. All right. One of the big events that everybody covered uh, was the breach that occurred at the spit down to uh, Barnegat Inlet in the town or borough of Mantaloke. An inlet was cut through. Uh, there was more than one breach. Uh, damage was incredibly extensive, and an all-out effort was made successfully to close this inlet by uh, November 3rd. This flight was about the 1st of November. Now, the projects that have been built in New Jersey have widened the beaches and raised the elevations of the dunes, sometimes with local conflicts over views and other issues. But what happens on these wider beaches is the waves break further out to sea and trade energy by movement. Once the wave breaks, it loses energy fairly rapidly with the white water and the turbulence. So they roll across the flooded beach and losing energy as they go. The Hurricane Sandy results in Point Pleasant Beach Borough up in Northern Ocean County was that yes, the water came into town, but with far less energy in each wave than happened in Mantaloking where the waves actually physically broke on the dunes, which were only about 40 feet in total width. So they lasted about two hours uh, during the storm. Uh, a friend of mine up there, one of the councilmen, his house reported to him about the destruction that was taking place. First it said, entry, entry, entry into the house. Water damage, water damage, water damage, and then silence at uh, 7.53 p.m. on the day Sandy made landfall. So the eroded sand in these co uh, coastal projects does more likely stay in the system, either offshore or on the beach, rather than wash into Barnegat Bay. Um, periodic maintenance is required. This is right now 65% federal, 35% non-federal. New Jersey shares the non-federal share, 75% state pay, 25% local. So the local project of any project is $87,500 local money for every million dollars spent on the project. So that's essentially the quick summary. Sandy made landfall in Brigantine. South, the wind turned west, allowing only one tide. Long Island and New Jersey are actually shaped like a funnel as you come into New York Harbor, and that accelerates or amplifies the storm surge just by the geography. Um, Northern Ocean County got the worst of the storm. Uh, Nortley Beach and Mantaloking were devastated. Monmouth County coastline, in spite of the fact that it sits at a higher end elevation than the Barrier Islands, uh, uh, still was severely impacted. And Raritan Bay, New York City, and Long Island were severely affected. Let's look from south to north really quickly. Avalon, after Sandy. This is the dunes in northern Avalon. You can see sand was washed over the dune, but the dune remained intact. There was zero damage to the oceanfront properties from flooding or a little bit of wind damage here and there, but nothing really extensive. Moving north, this is the beach after Sandy in Brigantine, southern Brigantine, looking the building in the way north end is the uh, Brigantine Motor Hotel, now a condominium complex. That's at uh, 15th Street South. 
This is 43rd Street. You can see a scarp in the dunes and a huge wide beach. So the sand in the dunes was carried seaward and deposited as a very flat, low gradient beach after Hurricane Sandy. But that sand's still in the system. So it returned to build the beach after the hurricane. However, LBI North, things changed. Here is, uh, this is down in uh, southern LBI, Beach Haven. Um, You've got these, uh, these are sidewalk and street sections. You can see the house in the back is severely damaged. Things on slabs and pilings, uh, not on pilings, did not do well. Uh, you can see the vehicle on the lower picture. And this is the contrast to where the core projects, Army Core projects, were completed Harvey Cedars, Brand Beach, and Surf City. I'm standing on the scarp cut in the dune where a third of the dune was removed. But there was no wave damage to the structures landward of it from the waves. Yes, tidal flooding occurred, but the wave damage was eliminated. Looking south from this position, you can see where the dunes existed. And then further on south, we go into uh, uh, Holgate, where the dune was not enhanced by the project, and overwash was uh, complete. Ortley Beach. This is Ocean Avenue in Ortley Beach. I'm standing in the road. This is what was left of it. The houses on the landward side of the roadway were demolished almost completely. The highway was five feet lower. There was no asphalt. There was no subgrade. The manhole covers, here it is. There's the, there's the sewer system. We're three and four feet out of the ground. So we had incredible damage. Now, we knew that this was a vulnerable spot because the dune itself in front of the boardwalk was about 35 feet wide, about 11, 12 feet high. And the beach width in front of that dune was about maybe 45, 50 feet. So the hurricane waves just demolished Ortley Beach. Here we have massive damage in mantelloking. There's some interesting aspects of this. This home here is a flow-through system. The waves went through the front windows, and everything in that house is in Barnegat Bay. The refrigerators, the stoves, the furniture, the rugs, everything. And the front roof there is sagging a bit because the house nearly collapsed. But you see the back, back window set is a little bigger than it had been previously. The stuff in the house becomes massive battering rams once the braves break through the front wall of any structure. And they will make their own pathway out the landward side of the building. All right. The other thing is storms are incredibly mercurial. Here you have the liquor cabinet. <laughs> Bottle's still up there, folks. In fact, there was an empty sitting there. It must have fallen down. It was dutifully empty by the uh, first of uh, <laughs> the providers there. Uh, but anyway. Here's another one. This is the first floor. It was up there. There's the chimney. But you notice there is a very nice vase, the fireplace tools, and a coral head from a tropical paradise vacation still sitting on the hearth. Perfectly OK. There was another one we have where the dining room table is still set with the plants on, uh, plant in the middle of the dining room table after the damage was done. Here we have. And interesting, this, of course, undercut the foundation. That's what happens. The house rotates. It's not worth much at that angle. This place is Lyman Avenue right here. This house, you can see, it has a fairly decent dune. You can see it extends all the way up to there. The big surprise was we didn't know it was put on telephone poles. This was built in the 50s. And these are creosote telephone poles. Somebody drove pilings and set this building on telephone poles. It was still there after the storm. But you can see the amount of erosion that took place. Uh, if I go back to the previous picture, there it is. That's all dune material. It was insufficient to withstand the assault of Hurricane Sandy. Moving north well, from here, this is the USGS cut and fill. This is pre-Sandy. This is a view, LIDAR view, after Sandy, elevation data. This is the composite, and the red is six meters. Six times three is 18 feet. It's a rough estimate of the total amount of material removed from the shorefront of mantle oaking by Hurricane Sandy. And the devastation continued north. This is my last one. Pullman Avenue in Elbron is at elevation 34 feet. 
We're sitting at about 34 feet right here, right now on the second floor. That's how high this house was above sea level. And the water, this was an oceanfront home. And there was a rock seawall in front of them that was at elevation 16 or 18. Then there was the bluff cliff face that went up to 34 feet. And this is, I'm standing in the, fr in the front room. There is no front wall. And everything was devastated. The problem was the guy's lot was cut down by a third. The house is gone, and the property is vacant because it cannot be rebuilt on because there's nothing to build on the land because the land's gone. So the problem was extensive. The situation was addressed by Public Law 113-2, passed by Congress uh, in January of 2013, in which the US Army Corps of Engineers was authorized to proceed to restore its constructed projects 100% at federal expense. This meant that each one of these communities where they had established a authorized, constructed, and even yet to be constructed project were, uh, were available for 100% federal cost restoration. And everybody went, oh, thank God for small favors here. And this process continued at breakneck speed from 19, uh, 2013 through 2015 and included Projects were authorized, but not yet constructed, such as Strathmere and Sea Isle City, uh, a central portion of Monmouth County between Allenhurst and Long Branch, and the yet-to-be-constructed portion of the Wildwoods. It's a project. It's going through the final stages of, of project definition and authorization. It's authorized, but it hasn't been uh, through the final engineering phase of it, and I'll let Mr. Watson deal with that, but those efforts were material in restoring New Jersey beaches to their conditions we see today. Thank you. Oh yeah, here is one last thing. This is Ocean City, 1991. Here's this gazebo right here. This was over the water at high tide. Here's the same gazebo today. One Beachville, 1992. In some parts, you only need one because this beach has remained stable and expanding ever since 1992. That's, uh, great. Uh, thanks very much, Steve. Let, let me introduce uh, Dave Rosenblatt, uh, our colleague from the Department of Environmental Protection. He's the Assistant Commissioner for Construction and Engineering. It's uh, never a good idea to follow Stu, just, it's not. <laughs> given, a, given a podium in Atlantic City, I, I always have the urge to, to uh, talk about the fact that uh, I was the fourth generation uh, to live in a home in, on Delancey Place in Atlantic City. Uh, and uh, my great-grandfather owned a beer garden on the boardwalk. Uh, way back in the Nucky Johnson time period. And uh, last time I said this in this very room, it was pointed out to me that I, my great-grandfather paid Nucky Johnson a lot of money for that privilege. <laughs> so, um, so let me start. Good morning, all. Um, after hearing what Stu had to say and uh, knowing what uh, our information tells us, uh, I can confidently say, speaking for Commissioner McCabe and the department, that New Jersey is in... Uh, a very good position for the tourism season. We have wide beaches uh, that can, can and will be used for the normal sunning and uh, beach concerts, and in the case of Wildwood, motorcycle and hot rod races. Uh, and we're in a good position for hurricane season due to the large volume of sand on the beaches and in the dunes. Now we've raised expectations. People know what these new beaches look like, what beaches can look like. And our challenge is to meet uh, those expect expectations in the future. Uh, and that is going to require continued funding and continued efforts on all our parts. Um, we are also very mindful of the challenges that we face with Back Bay flooding. As any resident in the, those communities will tell you, uh, they're not impacted by the ocean under most circumstances, uh, that they are uh, affected on 
the monthly high tides, storm tides. So we will be focusing a lot more on, on the Back Bay communities and how to address their flooding concerns. What we want to do as we address uh, the, the current flooding concerns and the future flooding based on climate change and sea level rise is get away from the uh, spot to spot emphasis that a lot of municipalities have. We need to fix this bulkhead here, this bulkhead here, and not address the entire flooding situation. Uh, we are going to be uh, involved in a lot more um, regional uh, resilience planning in the future. We've already started some of those efforts uh, with uh, some of our non-governmental organization uh, uh, partners. Um, in addition to the state or condition of the beach itself, uh, we are, as usual, in a good position from a coastal water, water quality perspective. We have long been a leader in protecting water quality or beaches. Uh, we have strong state and local cooperative monitoring partnership that really is second to none in the nation and has been since we actually formed it back in the 80s. Um, we remain committed to ensuring all of our coastal resources, so important to the state's identity and economic, economic vitality, are protected for all of us to enjoy. Now, the takeaway points regarding ocean water quality is that over 97% of the time, our coastal water quality is above the state of the standards. Uh, we've had, point two, we've had always one of the best monitoring programs, which includes just, just not uh, weekly water testing, but also daily coastal surveillance flights. So uh, with that, uh, we look forward to a great beach season. Uh, and I personally want to thank the towns that work with us on the beach projects uh, and the public's work, public works people that go a long way to uh, working and ensuring that uh, coastal water quality is, uh, is what it is. Um, and with that, Keith? Yeah, uh, 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 thank you oh. very much, uh, Dave. Before uh, Keith comes up, I want to acknowledge that we've got another Army Corps representative in the room, uh, our friend uh, Suzanne Rice from the New York District. And I uh, appreciate her being here. She came from Bergen County. Um, but let me introduce uh, uh, Keith to talk about the great work that the Army Corps has done. All right, I prepared some notes. <laughs> well, uh, you know what engineer Joey's That's right. Well, uh, thank you, Dr. Klein. Uh, Stu, Dave, I want to thank you all for being here and. Uh, Thank the Stockton Center for giving the Corps the opportunity to speak on the beaches. Uh, my name is Keith Watson. I'm a project manager out of our Philadelphia office. I manage uh, a large number of the coastal projects along the shore from Manasquan Inlet down through uh, Cape May and Cape May Point. Um, you know, there's a lot of people that were mentioned earlier, and uh, you know, we can't do our job without uh, cooperation of this state, local, and federal level. And uh, some of the federal officials uh, that should get some credit for where the state of the beaches are today are Congressman Hughes, who was mentioned earlier, Congressman Lobiondo, and Congressman Jim Saxton, uh, who's now uh, Congressman MacArthur, also supporting us uh, immensely. It's great to be in Atlantic City, uh, where we've just completed our seawall and uh, boardwalk restoration. I don't know if anyone was able to be down to the ribbon cutting event, but it was uh, fantastic. Um, the project is one of the uh, highlights of our reconstruction after Sandy. Uh, it's We've used over 99,000 tons of stone for the project, uh, and it'll be there for many years to help reduce storm damage impact on the northern end of Atlantic City, as well as keep the uh, historic boardwalk open. And uh, our partners in the state and the city are going to extend that boardwalk all the way around to the Gardner's Basin. So you'll be able to bike, ride, or, you know, if you're hardy enough, jog all the way down to the end of Ventnor. So that's uh, one, of the, one of our highlights. It's an honor to stand here with our partners, with whom we've accomplished so much along the New Jersey shore in the, in the past. Uh, the Corps has been involved with projects along the Jersey shore with coastal storm damage reduction for over 200 years. And in my personal case, 31 years. Um, 
Most of our co coastal projects in the region are now complete. Stu alluded to that a little bit. Um, there's one project left in the Wildwoods that, that is authorized but hasn't completely passed through the engineering phase and design as well as uh, some of the other things like real estate, et cetera, that need to be uh, obtained. Along with the coastal storm damage reduction projects, we're also very proud of the number of ecosystem restoration projects we've, we've completed along the shore uh, to enhance the environment and the communities along the shore. And most of you probably have visited one of our coastal storm damage reduction projects or ecosystem restoration projects in, in the past. Uh, there's not much of the shore the Corps hasn't been involved in and uh, worked with our partners. All the projects now that Stu referenced that have been authorized for construction into the construction phase have been either completed and or under construction at this time. Uh, you know, as I said, the projects don't happen out of nowhere. There are so many people involved to get them from an idea, a need of, of uh, replenishment or protection to a solution and ultimately funded and constructed. So uh, we're well aware it, it, it's not the core, it's all the people in the local communities, the state and universities such as Stockton, who's been a great partner. Uh, the most recent round of projects throughout New Jersey with DEP and the local communities, along with academia and private industry. There's a number of firms that work with us to replenish the beaches, uh, keep the beaches up, and build seawalls, et cetera, along the shore. Um, they also are part of this teamwork. And I'm happy to report at this time that these policies and strategy that we have employed and, and worked together with, there are healthy, beautiful beaches out there in New Jersey, up and down the coast, that are ready for the uh, upcoming hurricane season, but also there for uh, the tourists to, to take advantage of. And, um, you know, that vital infrastructure is being protected as well as the beaches are open and ready, ready for all for the summer. So since Hurricane Sandy, uh, this work has been nonstop. Stu alluded to that. Uh, we have dredged, pumped, or placed more than 40 million cubic yards of sand onto the beaches from Mantaloking uh, to Cape May Point, and that doesn't include our partners, partners to the north at New York District with Susanna who's representing here today. That's enough sand to fill Lincoln Financial Field approximately eight times. And I had to scold my uh, PAO director for putting that other stadium up north as a true Eagles fan you know, <laughs> in my notes. I had to change that one note. Um, you know, this includes projects to work to restore projects that were in place before Sandy and construct the new projects, such as the Mantaloking you know, or the Manasquan to Barnegat Reach, which includes Manaloking, Bayhead, Seaside Park, Seaside Heights, and the other local communities up there. Currently, you know, building that Northern Ocean County dune and berm system, this will be one of the largest beach fills that the Corps of Engineers has ever undertaken under one contract uh, in the country. It stretches 14 miles from Point Pleasant Beach to the border of Island Beach State Park. Approximately 11 million cubic yards of sand, and I think probably in the end more, uh, will be able will be placed to put that protective beach and template in place. Uh, you know, as all uh, knew or have followed, and Dr. Farrell had put up on the screen, uh, those communities were especially hard hit during Sandy. So when this project, this vital project, will reduce storm damage and help protect people and property along that reach, uh, which is very important. In addition, we are currently underway with the nourishment of Long Beach Island and just completed the initial construction of Absecan Island. They were two of the projects that Dr. Farrell mentioned that were uh, already constructed but were rebuilt in its, their entirety after Sandy due to Public Law 113. Uh, my counterparts in New York District, uh, they cover the New Jersey coast north of Manasquan Inlet. So the Philadelphia District, the jetty is technically in Philadelphia District. Everything north of that is run out of New York District. They are also busy restoring projects. Uh, they've placed sand on beaches from Seabright to Manasquan to reduce risk on those communities. The Seabright to Manasquan reach is now complete, is now complete which uh, that was no small feat if anyone has followed that in, in the news. Um, I'll highlight one other project that's ongoing, the Port Monmouth project along the Raritan Bay and Sandy Hook Bay. It includes construction of levees, flood walls, pump stations, dune restoration, and beach fill. To 
really distill down, I think, the message from, from all three of them. Uh, the, the, the beaches are in great shape because we've had really thoughtful and planful public policy and with terrific partners from uh, the federal government, state government, local government partners, and uh, our uh, researchers and experts uh, at our colleges and universities and, and proudly for us here at the Hughes Center to be able to work with experts like uh, Dr. Farrell and his, uh, and his team at the Coastal Research Center.